cursor here. <laughs> Did you see that? They were circling yeah. the time. <laughs> Those are serious paddles, man. Believe me, I was a little worried when they came in my office for those. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It is 6.01 p.m. It is April 6, 2022, and we are convening a regular meeting of the Cloud Board of Education. Mr. Mucha, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Prowse? Here. Mrs. Shuker? Here. Mr. Shachaki? Here. Mrs. Etter? Here. Mr. Dobbin? Here. Five present, none absent. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome all students, staff, parents, and interested community members to today's Board of Education meeting. The Ohio Legislature. Past uh, 197, eight months COVID health crisis. We could probably skip that. Yeah, I think we can skip that. Uh, yeah. How about we go to the next paragraph? The board guys encourages public comment on education issues and is now asking the public. No, we're not asking email. We have public participation. So uh, if you would like to uh, address the board this evening, please do so in the public comments portion of the meeting. A copy of the board meeting agenda is available to review on our district's website. Would you? Join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I have a motion to go to see this agenda, please. So moved. Ms. Sugar moves. Second. Mr. Suchaki seconds. Any discussion? Amendments? No. Mr. Shuker? Aye. Mr. Suchaki? Aye. Ms. Prowse? Aye. Mrs. Zetter? Aye. Mr. Dobbin? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Uh, agenda item 3, presentations. Mr. Evans? I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Janatovich to introduce Mr. Patterson, who's going to introduce his team. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction here. We have Mr. Patterson here and Mr. Rademacher, and they have a group of teams that they have competed with the science club that's called STEM Wars. They went to Beachwood High School. Um, they spend a lot of time, a lot of afternoons, a lot of work um, going into this. So I'm going to turn it over to the advisors if they want to share a little bit more. If not, the kids are, are here ready to, to share about this program, what they learn, the impact that it has, and, and, and why um, things like this is what makes Skyhawk Heights a great school. Yeah, I'll start before um, they're going to give you the nitty gritty of what it was like to compete. But um, hopefully, and I think we have some pictures, is that correct? But so this is actually a culmination of about what was originally supposed to be a year of work, mm -hmm. but um, STEM boys got canceled last year, which was really devastating. Everybody knows why. Um, but we now have th these boats here in these images are were, were constructed last year and have been sitting in the back of my classroom waiting for this moment. Um, <laughs> two, sorry, two years ago. And so they've been sitting, waiting for this moment for us to hoist these trophies, which the uh, participants will tell you a little bit more about. Um, and the, the team is actually, we have quite a few people um, actually get to attend the event. Um, but these are some of our star athletes um, in, the, uh, in this experience. So Caleb, if you'd like to start. Uh, sure. Make sure, please introduce yourself, gentlemen, <clears throat> as you, as you Talk about what you're going to talk about here. Um, I'm Caleb Graff. I'm a junior in the STEM Wars program. All right, uh, I'm Antonio Schifalo. I'm a senior, and uh, I help participate in the STEM Wars. I'm Mason Jones. I'm senior. I was one of the two people who built those boats two years ago. <laughs> uh, I'm Andy Dzolski, and uh, I'm a senior. <laughs> my, okay. Uh, I guess my role this year was trying to uh, make it seem a little bit more interesting to the rest of the We had like seven members. Seven members before, mm -hmm. and this year uh, we created a little like a, almost like a trailer, like a motivational kind of thing to get people involved. We based it around the Netflix series Squid Game, uh, without all the violence, of course. Uh, <laughs> and we had to turn. 
turnout of uh, 42 sign-ups. So that's a, we had a great turnout, got the school involved. Uh, and then we made a, a little video pitch to all of them. Oh, and part of it was up on the screen. <laughs> That's a uh, uh, senior Brady Center. <laughs> Sold the show and probably won us our uh, probably won us our video. Uh, this is our video trophy. Uh, when we were sitting in the stands to get all the trophies, they played uh, the videos from different schools. I think there's a there's Lincoln West there, Independence, uh, Eastwood. Was Cardinal one of them? Probably yeah, Cardinal. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Um, they played our video. It was last. Intentionally last. Yeah, mm -hmm. and everyone just went crazy and we automatically got the first place track. <laughs> <laughs> but then the another thing to second in is the boat race. Um, this year the both boats finished. It was in Coney and I on a team and Lily Frank and Alex Crocker on a team. Um, first year of a boat's ever finished, which was pretty good. <laughs> These are the titles me and Antonio used. We came in second place with the time of oh. about a minute. Um, it was just, competing was fun. It was scary at first because it felt like we were going to flip over. <laughs> um, but the boat was actually very good. Anything to say about the construction crew? Uh, the construction bit, we, Mr. Patterson tasked me and Tommy Wilson, another senior, or another sophomore at the time, not senior, in creating two boats purely out of cardboard. He just gave us like 30 boxes and some tape, said, do your thing. And two years ago, me and Tommy kind of looked at winners from the past races and things, and we worked out a design that you could spin around in a 180. You don't have to turn the whole boat around. We made it so it was structurally intact along the, the breaking points where other teams' boats were immediately collapsing in. Oh. And we used a lot of tape. <laughs> like, how many rolls did you guys use? Uh, I think <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Her boat was about 12 rolls of tape, um, but we were actually at a uh, slight disadvantage because the year that we were canceled, um, if you can tell in this boat right here, um, we were only allowed to use, to save money from the year prior, we were only allowed to use the see-through packing tape. Then, um, this year they were like, use whatever you like, and of course people <laughs> bought rolls and rolls of duct tape, which are significantly stronger and, and make a better boat. But we were, you know, we we invested so much time into these boats, we simply added a little bit more um, duct tape to that boat, and we kept this one completely 100% clear tape, and uh, and still had two boats finished, which was not true for uh, for many of the boats that tried to uh, compete in the semi. All right, and then our third trophy is for the magazine design cover. Can you all see this? One more, one more. <laughs> this one right here. Uh, Lily Frank, she's a senior here. She's a very talented artist, drew this uh, magazine cover. Uh, we uh, talked about the new mascot at Heights, and it's called Good Heights Ethan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so nice. It was great. It was, uh, yeah, that was that was a fun submission because it's um, it's it's a step more so like technology and science and obviously um, all those, but we kind of um, didn't super ask, but we said like. You know, we have some artists in our crew, and what if we, instead of doing it online, she's very, very talented with painting and, like, actually doing something uh, by, her, by her hands. And so she kind of came up with that, and, um, and it was so unique amongst the other submissions that, like, it was, it was eye-catching. And, um, and so that one, did, uh, that one did place. And so there was other events that we, that, that we competed in, about seven of them in total. But to come away with the events that we competed in, of the four that four, we competed in four of the seven, and we came out with trophies in three of those events. So that was, um, that was very exciting for, for the crew. As a, you I'll be a senior next year, so if I'm imagine doing this, um, you know, I try to bend those a little bit and use less tape on those. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that. The best part was they came back, they got back to school right before the end of the day, and, and I looked up at my desk and there was like 25 of them standing in my office with these <laughs> panels and trophies, and, and, and we we won STEM wars. <laughs> What's going on? So but there was, it, I, I wish I had video of them coming back in because they were they were so excited about uh, afterwards of the competition. And uh, and Chief, I, was there any rumor that, truth to rumor, that the only reason you got to go on the boat is because it was wrestling season and you were still cutting weight, so you were light <laughs> at the time. I guess you could say a good portion of it. That was great. You know, that was 20 pounds lighter. Not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Um, you know, we got trophies. You guys learned a lot, but, but obviously participating in these events go way beyond trophies. Is there anything that you say you could take away from participating in this that, you know, made you better 
better critical thinkers, made you more interested in science, made you better citizens and teammates and stuff? Was there any other of those other skills that maybe isn't easily seen in the trophy that you got by participating in this um, you know, throughout that process? Well, that's a good question. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, after uh, senior year, I'm going to Akron to go into a career in STEM, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to see like what are events and stuff that I get people interested in to get people to move into STEM because I really think that's a big part of our future working in STEM and I think I'll, are you going for STEM? Going for STEM? Yeah, I'm going cool. for STEM. I'm still good on the side. Most of the kids in the club want a career in STEM and it's great for people. <coughs> I mean, this competition gets everyone interested. It shows them the fun side of the job. Not every job is fun. I'm sure we all know that here, but a career in STEM will at least make you a little bit I wasn't in science club before this year, but well, the first event was egg drop, and I love making mm -hmm. egg drops. <laughs> so um, that was, they did a really good job of getting people in the club. And I wasn't even supposed to compete in the boat race. It was supposed to be great adventures. But <laughs> I was like, you know, I'll do it. I'm, I like kayaking. Like, <laughs> yeah. Sucky, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll, I'll also add on to the boat race that uh, before me and Caleb uh, went out, I was, I was talking with Ray Zimmer and Andrew at one point. Uh, we were trying to discuss his plans and why we wanted to do it on the boat race. But as it uh, turns out last minute, uh, I was going to be partnered up with Caleb. But um, uh, with that, uh, we didn't have too much time for event plan to create. So essentially, like even on the fly during like the middle of the race, like we just <laughs> we instantly just did our best to come up with something quick and just quite effective. Quite effectively gave us a second place. So yeah, they were they were flying too wide. Yeah. They can't tell me I'm from. <laughs> I was going to say, can you share your strategy? Yeah. So basically, Antonio said, I'll paddle left, you paddle on the right side. And I said, okay. And it felt like from my perspective, I did half the paddles I needed. Just being in the back, you know, weighing it down a little bit. But I mean, that was basically all we did to it. And our turn was really on the fly. Instead of doing like a swing around in the boat, um, since I would be heavier, so I shouldn't have fun, we actually turned around. I think he just pushed off the wall and just kept paddling. Because you have to go there and back, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Jantovich may basically ask what I was going to ask, but I always like to find out from people when they do something like this, what's the highlight? What, what will you remember? What was the highlight of, of the event? And uh, not even just the event, but the whole program that you participated in. I got this one. Um, we, remember, <laughs> we remember Tommy, we built those boats huge, though, as I said. And just the sheer satisfaction knowing that car, you made a cardboard boat that actually made it across the finish line was just pure bliss. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have the video, but he, Tommy jumped off the, the bleachers in a <laughs> cheering way. He's, he's fine. He's, he's fine. fine. <laughs> <laughs> he, he kind of slipped and just fell and ate it. But <laughs> it, was, it was the was <laughs> one of the the like purest moments of absolute joy I've ever seen where he literally <laughs> fully lost control of his body and fell out of his chair. It was like, he was just so thrilled to see the culmination of that effort because we spent hours on these boats, yeah. right? That was just, that was, that was thrilling. Yeah. Lily Frank that did the cover. Lily, for those of you that don't know, Lily's also the author of The Interlocking CH um, that actually is on the school license plate and that Andy's got on his chest there. Um, that was a uh, mm -hmm. uh, the story behind that is several years ago, the one of the state legislators uh, w was going to sponsor a, a school license plate for us, and they told me, don't send me the Indian head down. Uh, I want something other than that. So I went to Mr. Schaefer in November and said, listen, by January, I need a logo I can send to Columbus for them to put on a license plate for us. And he talked to two or three students, uh, and after, the, we, after we came back after Christmas break, brought me up the... Uh, uh, the inter uh, several done by Lily and and the interlocking CH was just right now it just it just jumped out and we sent that down and we've been using it ever since and I think at the time Lily was a middle schooler I think at, at the time Lily was a middle schooler at the time so we've been yeah. this is probably year five of us using that interlocking CH as hmm. is, is one of our uh, kind of our, our logos plug too we talked about Lily art show if anybody's interested on Friday art show <laughs> Lily's artwork, I did a talk on it, and with everybody else, I was blown away by it. Is 
it only Friday from this, the, sec this, the second day of the show on no. Saturday? No. Friday. Yeah. Okay. It's in my classroom. I just want to say congratulations. It's awesome to hear, because I know several of you, that it sounds like you really took, like, each individual's strength and really, like, you know, focused on that and rode with it. And just congratulations. Way to bring home three trophies. It's awesome. Smiles on your face say everything. Thanks for taking the time out to come to the board meeting, too, yeah. and tell us about it. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna preempt myself here with, with my presentation. I've got Reno Conapelli here, and most of you know Reno. Reno's a, uh, a lifelong resident of the district and a former board member, a longtime fireman in the district. But uh, really, Reno's passion for many many years has been working with OSBA. So uh, we Mark and I saw Reno over Monday night over at Lorraine and. Uh, Reno asked to come over tonight, so Reno, I'll turn it over to you. Well, you know things are going good when I'm the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, I'm Reno Conapelli, Brooklyn Heights resident, proud to be a Brooklyn Heights resident, and a former board member here, but I also work for the School Board Association. At our spring conference, I, I, I told Tom that we uh, honor two, two of the things here at Cuyahoga Heights. First of all, we already, we already did this at the Capitol Conference, but out of the uh, 19 counties that I have and 225 school districts, uh, we have selected the Scarlet Angels to perform at Capitol Conference. We give them a nice little plaque there, but I wanted to come by and just give them a nice little wall certificate. Excellent. Thank you. So I'll make sure. Up in the music yep, room. Absolutely. And then, 10 years ago, I was sitting right there, and this guy got elected. And um, he had replaced uh, two good board members at the time, Ron and Ken. You remember that? Poor Gary has come in at a tough time. <laughs> like, why do you really want to do this? <laughs> of all the things you can do, uh, but Gary, even though he was a new board member, had a lot of experience. Uh, part of the levy campaigns, music boosters, part of the facilities commission, the uh, master plan committee. And I remember sitting down in Gary's house in December that year, because I was on my way out. Uh, I had two more years to go. And we had a nice conversation. And I knew Gary was going to be a good board member, because he was about Cuyahoga Heights and he was about kids. And I remember when I left um, about eight years ago, I said, Gary, I hope one day you serve long enough where you can enjoy being a board member. Remember that? <laughs> I do remember and I hope, I hope you're there. Yeah, I hope you're there now in yeah. 10 years. Because I know you came there in some tough times, and you didn't get a break. You seriously didn't get a break. And I want to rehash all that. <laughs> but you couldn't pay me enough money to sit where you're at today. But Gary, on behalf of uh, myself, the Northeast region, at OSBA, um, we'd like to congratulate you on 10 years of service. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And for me, it's truly an honor, because I, I get to do this all over the state, but I, but I really know somebody that well. Um, it's just an honor to watch you through the last 10 years, and, and truly. And you guys are in good hands, and thank you for all what you do. I know what you go through, the meetings you got to attend, the time away from your family. The amount of time you have to put into it, so on behalf of myself and the house and the residents and the house school board association, thank all five of you what you guys do and hang in there. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. And I'm here anytime you guys need something. I'm here because um, I'm right there in Marco Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Greenhouse. Thank you. Can we get a photo? Oh yeah, sure. Yep. I'll put my official. Name. <laughs> I'm actually going to come over and, and do it and do something really? funny. Yeah, if you want to, just like, you know, memorialize. Grab your award, Gary. Grab your award. Like a, like a student of the month. Yeah. <laughs> come on, Gary, you know this pose. <laughs> Take care. Okay, I have a couple things that I want to go through. Uh, one of the things is on the agenda, the other is not. The, uh, the first is a, a little bit about branding, and, and we have every intention that when we decide on what the image of the mascot is going to be, is to brand that image. And uh, I reached out to Margaret and Charlene Paparizos, and once again, they were Johnny's on the spot, and lo and behold, 
uh, Charlene had already done this for two districts, uh, Chagrin Falls and for North Royalton School. So she sent me over the packets and we had a great, about an hour long conversation about what the branding is going to look like. And I just want to kind of give the board a little bit of a heads up because we are working on what the images look like right now. And this is just a little bit of Chagrin Falls and I think we're going to use a lot of what's in this, but maybe not all of it. Um, and we'll go through the purpose identity and, and there's the front part of this is a, a lot about uh, request uh, for the branding folder. One of the reasons for branding is to keep to keep the image standardized and you'll see as we go through this that there's going to be images that are going to be our images that go on our uniforms, that go on our letterhead, that go on anything Cuyahoga Heights and there's going to be a certain way of doing it and quite honestly there's been a lot of different imagery used through the years and and uh, I, I don't know who I was joking with but even from the from, with the Redskin you know, there was the running redskin with the tomahawk in its hand, and even the, even the head of the redskin, if you look around enough, there's probably six or seven images that have been used, some with a full headdress, some without, some with the earring, some without the earring. So we're looking to standardize that. So uh, anybody from the school that wants to use it for, uh, for cloth or for any, anything that's related to the school, that we have a standard image that we would use with that. Um, some, of the, some things we have in place will stay. I, I think... Uh, many of you have already have seen the, uh, the 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 logo that has the flame in it. That we'll keep that as one of the, that's on that's on the bottom of my emails. Uh, it, it's kind of a crest. Uh, we'll keep we'll keep that. We'll keep the CH. Quite obviously, that's sir that's served us very well. But but the actual mascot itself, we'll, we're going to kind of add to that. The official school name and district, and this is this is going to be a, a a conversation for us because I, I know. Uh, Mr. Guerrero, we, we are technically, by the state of Ohio, we are Cuyahoga Heights Local School District. So we're a local school. And, and, and Mr. Guerrero never went, never referred to us as a local school district. And we're not a city school district, but the state referred to us as a, as a local school, three communities that make up the district. So you know, he had kind of dropped that from it. You see Chagrin Falls is an exempted village school district, but we are a local school district, uh, technically according to the state. And then just the names of the, the buildings, and then even, even down to hashtags used in social media anymore. The mission statement, all this comes out of our, out of our uh, uh, that we have done already, and we'll certainly with the best committee, and we'll certainly add that to it. The official colors, um, uh, I just thought this was interesting because we've seen um, different iterations of even our scarlet and gray uh, used throughout through the years. So uh, we're going to make sure that we, that we categorize the colors with chagrin, with Kaga Heights scarlet and Kaga Heights gray, uh, so that in and, and digitize them by the numbers. So if we're calling a, a sporting goods company, we can just give them those numbers, and those are universal. Um, uh, and then because if you've done any, if you've run something on a copy machine, you know sometimes colors fade, or whatever, or or even sometimes via the internet, some sometimes colors don't come across the way you want to. But when you give the numbers, that takes it back to a coded number that that makes those colors uh, the way. And I, I think we've got. 40 maroon jackets down in the boosters club. And so <laughs> nobody knows how they showed up, but you know, <laughs> do some courses. Uh, uh, um, uh, they even went down to font. Um, we, that's something that we can discuss as well as we do that. Um, this is just some of the font work on that. Mm -hmm. The logo usage, uh, just the different setups for the logo usage, JPEGs and TIFFs and that type of thing. Just what some of the lettering looks like in in there. Again, you see that, and then the the branding of the mascot, and they're very particular. This this is the only tiger mascot that's used with Chagrin Falls, and to the point where they show you. Because okay. we know with Word and with with graphics, you can stretch images, and you can flop images. So they particularly tell you that hey, we're not flopping it, we're not stretching it. It's it's that image as projected. So you know when we, we when we come up with that. Uh, those images, we can kind of lock them in. Can you go up just a little bit too on that? Yeah, see the difference so, in some of them. Well, <laughs> it's very, very subtle, but yeah. you see the trademark on mm -hmm. the one, and then there, there's a, there's a very no very yeah. the variation is the one without the trademark a little bit lower down. Even that is a, a subtlety and that needs to be. The and, 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 heights with the color of the tongue. Well, and <laughs> see, see and that's a, that's a great point. In the end, we will look. To, we're going to trademark our. Lo our, our mascot logo. And, and Lindy makes a very valid point. <clears throat> uh, Garfield Heights is the Bulldogs, probably the second or third most used mascot in the state of Ohio. 
Well, what they found out, unfortunately, is that their, their mascot was identical to one that was already trademarked, so they had, to add a, they had to add a third color to theirs. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but when it comes to the printing of it, cloth and anything, a third color adds a lot more money to the print of it, uh, to, to getting things printed. So, you know, if something as innocuous as add, having to add a third color to a, a logo can, can be very costly in, in the long run when it, when it comes to getting things printed up. So, uh, They also did the, uh, something uh, for the elementary building, and, and we know with the... Uh, with the pups, that we, we may do something unique for the elementary students uh, uh, for the Red, Red Wolves and, and have a logo that uh, uh, a little bit separate for the, for the elementary students as well to, to separate the elementary building. Had a great book read over there today. They're super excited about it. And then we've got the interlocking CH, and we're going to stay with that interlocking CH, and we'll clean it up a little bit and make sure that we, we again, brand that the way we want that to be. And it's, it's interesting because you see the rounded one. Um, uh, I had a former board member's uh, child come to tell me that as we started to go through this process, that if you remember the AstroTurf before, the C was rounded, the CH was rounded in the, in the middle of the field, that they knew even back then when they put the first version of the turf in that they did not want to put the redskin head on for fear that with a 10-year lifespan of the redskin head, if, it, if, if, the, if the mascot changed at any point in time during that, that they would short-lived the life of the, a very expensive product for them. So they, that was the first time that the, a CH had been used at that point in time, and they used it on the football field. We've since changed it to the interlocking one, and that's what's in the, in the middle of the field out there right now. And then they have th this crest, and I, again, I wish I could pull it up. Uh, maybe when I get to my emails, I can, I can show you. It's on, the, it's on the bottom of all my emails. It's uh, the logo over at the, at the ESC. It's got kind of a flame and a... Uh, and it's, Lindy's looking now. <laughs> like, what is he talking about? No. It's, it's so good that you remember what it is. Um, <laughs> I do remember it. Oh, it's on, it's on, it's on, is it on the board docs? Oh, oh the upper left, thing? Upper left hand corner oh, of the board docs. Yeah, yeah, okay. I was thinking like flames. No, right? no, just, just something <laughs> simple. <laughs> and then, yeah, the typography too. So, <laughs> it, and then it also would translate to business cards and letterhead. And it would standardize those types of things because it, it's kind of, uh, you can see who's been in different offices at different times uh, <laughs> based on the business cards. I probably have three different business cards in the time that I've been here based on who I was working for or who was getting the business cards done at any given time. So mm -hmm. just to standardize some of those things coming through the, uh, coming out of the district. And I just think that all that, is, all that is good work for us as a district. So that's a little bit about what were some of the steps that we will begin to go through. Uh, I feel very confident working with uh, Charlene and, um, and Margaret with this. Char Charlene's done it a couple times, uh, and, and uh, it looks like it's going to be a fun process. The kids are really excited that they couldn't stop telling me. They, were, they wanted to show me all the different images that they were creating. Today I stopped down in Mr. Schaefer's art class, and one of his – what the students can do with their phones anymore is incredible. Well, the one student came up with her phone, and she had five different, she was swiping five different uh, logos, that she, mascot logos that she had done, and, and she was showing them Mr. Shea from what she was going to, how she was going to change them up a little bit. So um, I think the kids are excited, so I look forward to how we're going to kind of narrow that down as, as, as those come, come out of there. So um, the second thing I wanted to go, uh, go over a little bit, yesterday we had a BASA regional meeting, that's the state superintendents over at the ESC, and and some of the stuff, um, I'm just going to go through this relatively quickly, but this is just a, a regional update on things going on in the state, and I thought this would be really useful for the board. So you just kind of, uh, you hear some of the legislation, you know what's going on lobbying-wise, but and just just a, a multitude of things in the state. Uh, Circle back on a few things. The dyslexia screening services, uh, the, the dyslexia, uh, the guidebook, one thing they, they really emphasize with the, the dyslexia legislation is that the executive summary is what counts, that, that nobody can agree on this guidebook right now. So they told us, disregard the guidebook. They said, go to the law, and we're already putting in a place what's in the law, that there, that, that, that committee came out with 100 some recommendations to go into the guidebook. The, the, another committee came back to re reduce it down to 50. They're still not. So the guidebook, from what they said, may never get done. So they said, the law goes into effect. 
look at the law, uh, look at the bullet points on that, and, and we're, we're on pace to do that with our professional development, the things that we're, and the testing that we're going to put in place here with, this, with the dyslexia. So, yeah, we've heard a lot of talk about the guidebook, and they, they pretty much said that may be a far cry from settling itself at this point in time. And you see that it says stay tuned. Uh, financial literacy in school, we know that that's next year's freshman class that that starts with. Um, uh, a couple things about that is that uh, there's some flexibility with that. It can be taught uh, if your social studies teachers can teach it, family and consumer science teachers can teach it, and business teachers can teach that uh, as well. Um, there's also ways to pick up your uh, the licensure on that. Mr. Jantovich, how? What, what we're doing is we ran a study of districts in the area how government as a full year or a half a year. Um, there is zero correlation in test scores and the length of time the government is given. Um, you know, the old, there's two outliers. When we pulled out Brexel, Brexel had, they taught it for a half a year and they had like a 98% passage. Brooklyn taught it for a full year and they had like a 71% passage. So when you take that out, there literally was like a negative zero, 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 three actually showed that the shorter amount of time you have better results. So when we talk to the social studies department, they say actually the stretching out of the curriculum of government at times waters it down. So they feel that if you make government the semester and then you put financial literacy, then everybody gets a full government, then they get financial literacy, and then it gets tied in together um, to do that. So we legally have to have it in place for the freshmen, um, but we're going to start moving that process to give everybody that experience that um, for them to And by that, we mean that next year's freshman class has to have it as a graduation requirement, so some point in time during the four years. So um, can be granted simultaneously, too. That was They talked a little bit about that. Sports betting, I'm not sure why this came up because that uh, has nothing to do with us on the high school level, uh, with the exception that originally um, the money was supposed to come to 98 supposed, were supposed to profit education. Uh, the... Legislature backed off of that, so now half of it's going to go to K-12, and the other half is going to be used by the legislature to do what they want to do with it. So I, I would just be cautious about this because this is another one of those where people hear that the gambling proceeds are going to education. It, all of us have been around long enough to hear that lottery was going to be the fix for education funding in Ohio and know that like it's 0.1% of anybody's budget and in the state of Ohio, so it really has had no impact whatsoever. Um, and, and really, until three or four years ago, that rhetoric hadn't even begun to die down. People were still, what are you doing with all that lottery money? Well, we're not getting all that. So it just, and, and, and sports betting was pretty much sold the same way, but just to, you know, so when that crowd uh, says, what are you doing with all that sports betting money? Well, we'll, we'll show them the pennies that we're going to get from that in the, in the end. But uh, um, that, the May primary, uh, as you know, we've heard recently, it's going to take place on May the 3rd without the House and Senate races on August the 2nd at the low, low price of $25 million to the state of Ohio. So uh, the fact that they couldn't get the redistricting done. Uh, a big discussion came up um, as far as the, uh, Mr. Mucho's favorite group, the Auditor of State, um, and, and had to do with levy. Brookville Schools superintendent and four board members are currently being sued over a levy campaign, and over things that have taken place many, many times before. For instance, um, a superintendent, the superintendent got asked a, a, a levy question, and he responded to the levy question during his work day. So that's a violation. It was a violation for him that he needed to respond to it. So um, that's, there's... That's crazy. There's because what's the definition uh, well, of work day for a superintendent? And, well, it, which was which was part of the craziness that they went in to discuss because with some other people, the treasurer, you might be able to maybe define his workday a little more easily uh, as, uh, as a 8 to 5, but the superintendent might be here till 10 or 11 o'clock at night for a sporting event. So, what, so there's essentially 100 or some questions, and they said a 50 of which the answer from the auditor was maybe, oh. uh, on, uh, which doesn't help anybody. But um, there Levy campaigns are really coming under fire by, by some of these target groups, and um, it, as we get closer to that, we're going to really make sure need to make sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's with that. Never been an issue here before, but 
as Brookville found out, it was never an issue there before, but this special interest group, and sometimes the groups are not internal, they're outside groups that are, are now coming in and saying, and starting to attack the levy campaign. So um, as we head down that road, this is something that we're going to uh, really make sure that we have a real strict outline and, and stick to. Uh, we've done it, you know, last time we did it here in 2012, I thought it was done extremely well. Things were done outside of school. I don't think that uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Holland at the time, he, he was not a signer or on any of the, you know, signs don't show up here. He, he, none of, in none of the in none of the things that we send out as a district can we promote yes or no. We can merely state, talk about what the money's going to be used for and those types of things. So we can't present one side or the other as we start to present literature as a district. Now the campaign committee can do some things. So it was pretty enlightening and, and maybe it, enlightening is not the word, pretty frightening as, yeah. as well. Can um, I ask you, because you said board members too, so like if we're obviously we're all residents, but can we promote it? Like yes. Like have a sign in our house? Yeah, there's, our and, and, but like there's, there's a separate set of guidelines that, uh, that apply to you because quite honestly, we can talk about the need for a levy at the board meetings, but we can't do the vote yes for the levy uh, uh, okay. kind of rhetoric. So there's, and again, that's where the, that's where a lot of the maybe answers came in from the state auditor. So okay. um, uh, uh, crazy times. Um, Preschool integrated class, you know, we're ahead of the curve on the on the uh, on the on all the preschool rules. So this was a lot of stuff that didn't. Um, some things that we've heard before. The property valuation is it, it's we we've talked about this probably ad nauseum. Quite honestly, I, I I just thought that the funniest part. It's now in committee, and the committees are made up. Uh, the the it failed to clear the house. But the best part about this was for me was that when it. When it went back to the House to concur with the Senate's changes, it lost by a vote of 90 to 0. Even the sponsor, Representative Marin, voted no on concurrence with the Senate's changes to it. So um, uh, uh, I think you might have even had something in your email today about that committee is formed to start to, to hit some of those. I, uh, Senator Blessing, um, I, Tom Burton, some of you know Tom, Senator Blessing's from Tom's. Um, a district. Uh, Tom has told me that Senator Blessing is very approachable. I'm going to shoot an email out to him tomorrow about you know uh, opposing some of the changes in in in, in 126. So um, if you're so inclined, I you probably have been bombarded by OSBA the last couple of days with those emails though. Community reinvestment uh, at CRAs, uh, which are available to the cities. Um, some changes that have been proposed there. Uh, the threshold goes from 50 to 75 percent, requiring board approval for the CRA tax exemption. And the threshold from one million to two million, we, we quite honestly wouldn't meet either one of those. Uh, but the, just the, the simple facts. So uh, they're not sure if this is going to get legs to it or not. Just know that CRAs don't necessarily need our approval. And I was shocked at the number of superintendents in the room that don't get invited or, or to the table when those discussions take place in their communities. Uh, we have thankfully been invited to the table. Our three communities have made a really a concerted effort to as keeping us whole and tax abatements. Uh, we certainly want to continue to work with them and, and, and continue down that road. But this is, again, one more. Uh, where, you, where you've got communities that are at odds with the school district, this is going to be one more tool to keep money from school districts. Substitute flexibility. This is the flexibility that's currently in place. is going to get extended for two more years. That I uh, um, think that that's going to be pretty overwhelming there. Third grade reading guarantee. Two familiar faces are Gail Mannings from Lorraine County. Phil Robinson's out here in Solon. They've sponsored the, the removal of the, uh, of the third grade guarantee to, keep st to hold students in the third grade to keep them from advancing. So uh, at, the group feels that this one's going to, uh, this is a really strong possibility getting through it as a bipartisan support on this. Gail's uh, uh, a Republican, a very strong supporter of education, and, and Phil's uh, also been a very strong supporter of education uh, from the Solon area. I'll send these to you in the update this week as well. Uh, 606. Seizure safe schools, this adds a lot of requirements for uh, students on seizure plans. Uh, this was presented, um, the student, this wasn't a student that it was a result of this. This was a, this was a student who was no longer in school that had a seizure outside of a school and somebody kind of trans parlayed this into a school. So this puts a lot of restrictions on schools uh, as far as seizure plans and having students 
having adults in the building responsible for those students and the seizure plan and knowledge of that. So I, I'm not sure where this is going. This is certainly something, a very difficult topic, but it originated outside of schools and is now working its way into a school setting. This is 322's dropped, um, uh, divisive concepts, and, and we, if you read the newspapers, uh, uh, Senator Fowler uh, really kind of uh, stepped in it um, uh, with her comments about the Holocaust and some comparisons that she drew. Uh, so they think that, that this is, uh, even from Senator uh, Representative Cups, um, who's the co-sponsor of this, kind of said, we're going to have to just back off of this based on the approach, of course, that didn't stop 616 from popping up yesterday either. Statewide voucher system. Uh, this was interesting because uh, th this is the backpack bill, and I, I was unaware, and, and, but uh, uh, Representative McLean's one of the sponsors. He couldn't answer questions during testimony. So he sponsored a bill and didn't know anything about it. So from what, from what the lobbyist said, it was really kind of embarrassing that he stood up there and, and had a whole bunch of questions and couldn't answer them about this bill. So they don't, they don't, they're not sure, that they, don't, they have no way of knowing that's going to get funded, so they think that that backpack bill is going to go away. The teacher transparency bill, this is about the uh, uh, curriculums being uh, posted in, by July. Again, it uh, doesn't look like it's got a lot of support right now, but it's still kind of hanging around. Uh, eliminate the August special election is there. The point was made, this is, these are the sessions that the House and the Senate has left, which are not very many before they break. The problem is that when they come back after the election, it's a lame duck session, and then that's when things get crazy, as we know. That's when they, that's when they start dropping their special interest things into budget bills and everything else. So um, we, we were cautioned to make sure, and, I, and Mark, I think Monday night, they also, also cautioned us that, that we really need to be ready when... When the, when the House and Senate get back after elections, that lame duck period, we, we need to be all ears and we need to be ready to, to make, start making some phone calls and, uh, on, as, as some of these um, people try to get their special interest stuff added on to some things. So um, in the heart and souls, uh, uh, I just wanted to, this is, the, this is designed for schools to get legislators in their district. Obviously, Senator Dolan's busy right now running for that state Senate seat. So I, I wasn't going to approach Senator Dolan with trying to bring him over in, in the district when he's in the middle of uh, the campaign. Uh, Senator Robinson, or, or Representative Robinson, and uh, Representative from, I'm blanking on, from uh, Parma. Crossman. Crossman. Uh, have been here before. I was going to reach out to both of them to see if I could get them into the building, and maybe we could have the STEM work kids talk to them, do something. But it's been very well received. Crestwood was at the meeting. Uh, one of the state representatives was out there. Had a great, as a matter of fact, he was scheduled to be out at the school for an hour. He ended up spending three hours at the school because uh, he was having so much fun with some of the things that he was seeing. I think we have a lot to show him. This is just one of those things that the state has kind of urged us to do, just so. Uh, just so the legislators can see what's going on in schools. The, the feeling is that there are a lot of legislation is being proposed and recommended right now, and legislators aren't even in schools. They don't know what's going on in schools. So uh, try to get them in the buildings and see what's going on. So that's, that's uh, just a little bit of summary for me. And at that, I'll turn it over to, to Matt. So. Oh, yeah, so I see no one else in the audience, so we can move past public comments to Mr. Michio, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a few items tonight. Uh, first one is 5A, motion to approve the minutes of the March 23rd, 2022 regular meeting as found in attachment C1. Item 6A, motion to approve purchase orders over 5,000 as found in attachment C2. I ask for those motions for approval tonight. Okay, so, so may I have a motion to approve the trade with the secretary? Items? Moves. I'll second. Discussion? I uh, just wanted to point out uh, the two purchase orders, and we're trying to hold everything back for the second board meeting of the month of business. Uh, we had um, one that was pertinent, and uh, we rolled in another as well. Um, the first one, if we open item uh, 2A, excuse me, item 2, which is our lead sheet for purchase orders. Um, the first one is the pertinent one, so it's the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. This is an additional premium installment for period 1122 to 1123, $9,296. Um, 
This is the first time I have seen the Bureau of Work Workers' Compensation add an additional invoice for the premium installment. So employers pay premiums to establish and receive workers' compensation coverage. The Bureau of Workers' Compensation establishes the premium for the policy year. When I called and spoke with the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, they said they estimated our premium using numbers from two years ago. So once they updated it with numbers from the prior year, uh, this adjustment came through, so that's why we see this. Overall, it puts us, um, and I have that attachment in board docs under the admin content. Um, if we were to open that uh, PDF that we have there, uh, the transaction history, um, it's four pages, and we can see that the first page, pull this up a little bit. Um, this is the current period in which we have. So we have the installment, uh, two of those listed there, one from 3922 and one from 112621, and we get our early payment discount. So this is uh, what has not occurred previously. If we were to go to the second page, um, this is the prior year, and this is typically how it works out. We have our installment, then our early payment discount, our audit true up, and our go clean rebate. Uh, so we always true up after we pay our installment with the Bureau. And that total for that year was 55723 If we go to page three, this is a year prior to that. Again, we have our installment, early payment discount, our audit true up, and then our go clean rebate. Um, the uh, two added together are approximately 48000 So in that 50000 ballpark, and the last page, page four, Again, we have our installment, early payment discount, audit true up, and go green rebate, um, 55000 So when I got that email from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, I'm like, no, everything's a you know, machine. It goes in perfect order. So I was kind of thrown off by that. And when I called and they told me that you know, that was the case, that they had used numbers from previous years, um, they didn't really go into specifics on why that happened, just that they had this installment that we had to pay. So this is the long story short. Uh, the second. Um, uh, purchase order over 5000 is elementary school office furniture. So that's $21,694.09. And uh, Mr. Evans, myself, uh, Mrs. Houchin, we met, uh, and Mr. Young to discuss uh, the plans for the elementary school uh, in the main lobby that they have. And it uh, looks very interactive. There was a sitting area for the kids that they have as, uh, as well. So uh, the two items tonight. Yeah. Any, any other discussion, Mr. Uh, not okay. Yeah. Then let's move to a vote, please. Uh, Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Mr. Gavis. Aye. Ms. Press. Aye. Mrs. Schuker. Aye. And Mrs. Evans. Aye. The motion passes 5 0. Uh, Treasurer Sims, approve those comments. Uh, just two items tonight. The first one is the uh, AA discussion, May 2022 five year forecast timeline to present. Just going over the timeline that we have in place. Uh, so if we click into that, we can see it's May 11, 2022 at the board meeting that we have, the work session review of the five-year forecast, and then we would look to approve the five-year forecast two weeks later at our May 25th, 2022 regular board meeting. That's our timeline that we have. And item 8B, uh, this will be a fun one. So there's a lot here, and I worked on reconciling everything in front. These are the large spreadsheets. Uh, I spent a, quite a bit of amount of time on these and I'll roll through it. I'll, I'll try to keep it to a reasonable amount of time because uh, I, you know people's eyes glaze over when you talk numbers too much and no. it's not the most exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you um, say that. <laughs> so how all this happened is I got an email from Elena Sanders who's a financial manager over at uh, ODE, the Office of Budget and School Funding. And she goes, good morning Matthew. We have loaded into the payment detail tile the amount of $17,515.28 to be paid back to ODE for the insufficient adjustments during the months of February and March. The payment has to be paid prior to 5-15-22. Please let me know if you have any questions. Sincerely, Elena Sanders. Um, I'm going to explain through these reconciliations exactly uh, what occurred. So we have two sheets. Um, this is all for fiscal 22. We have a landscape and a portrait. If we look at our landscape, the longer one, um, there are two halves, the top half and bottom half. The top half would be our annual amounts provided by ODE. The bottom half are the monthly amounts. And everything is situated in columns. So. July number one, July number two, we get two payments a month. 
August number one, August number two, September number one, September number two, October one, October two, November one, November two, December one, December two. And after December is when the new funding formula, HB 110, came into play. Um, so if we look, uh, you know, our annual amounts at the top half of the page, um, we have our state support, which is letter A, the foundation formula. Um, that annual amount was 364219 and change. Um, it changes every month as we go. Uh, the additional aid items for student wellness and success funding, uh, then we have preschool special education funding and special education transportation, B, C, and D. E is the total of those additional aid items, so B, C, and D together. And then we have letter F, which is the total formula funding plus additional aid items. So the total, the 149 plus the 364 gives us our 513,000. Uh, then below we have our transfers. So a certain portion goes to the ESC, any open enrollment in or negative, any other adjustments positive or negative. Uh, that other adjustment negative, letter I, deals with our three students that are attending independence schools that we educate. So the money, the money gets automatically deducted from our foundation settlement that we have for those students. The total is 428957 and change. Now these are the annual amounts that ODE lets us know um, twice a month from the statements of settlement. The bottom half of the page are the monthly amounts. So we can see what we receive per month uh, for the foundation formula, about 50 The additional aid items uh, for B, C, and D, so student wellness and success um, was zero that we had. Now they had an annual amount that we can see in October number one that it goes to zero. So that was not in place. ODE just had to catch up on their adjustments to uh, the success and wellness uh, funds that we have. Uh, we have our preschool and special education, which is about 1,300. Um, that we receive uh, bi-monthly uh, totals up to 17914 We have our transfers, a small amount that we have there, and that's it. So it was a pretty simple formula as it was going before uh, the new funding formula came into play. So we can see each month, July, August, and at the bottom, we have something what's called year-to-date prior to payment. So this is on the statement of settlement. Um, and what it is, is it tracks the amount that ODE has paid to a district going forward. It's very complex and there's a lot of numbers at play um, with it. So the arrows I have in place kind of show that um, when we get the new uh, statement of settlement for July number two, uh, that amount of 14398 which is listed on that one, comes from the previous one. So that's the amount that we had received. So when we look at August number one, it's 29,122.38. That's the total of July number two and July number one that we would receive, the 14,398 and then the 14,724. So that's kind of how that calculation works below. Now there is a difference which I reconciled, um, color-coded, so we can see how that reconciliation comes into play. Um, the purple, 6246, the green, 1819.32, the blue, 5,933, and the red, 281.37, uh, that comes into play uh, when ODE gives us uh, certain adjustments that come by through the year. Um, so everything was working like clockwork. In October, uh, our student wellness and success funding at the top, row B, goes to zero because that funding um, did not hop over into the new year. Uh, we can see in October number two, the 72,000 871 and 30,725 come into play. This is our uh, SF14 money, which is our O'Keefe money. So we have approximately, I want to say, 12 students that are court placed, um, and we receive funding for the court placement of those students that we have. Um, and that's the first payment. We get two payments a year for those students. Uh, it's quite a bit. The difference between uh, the two lines are. Uh, special education and non-special education students that we have for that funding. Um, so that's the annual amount that we receive, and we can see that the payment came in in October number two. Uh, Mr. O'Keefe is very on the spot with sending us the invoices for payment on those, uh, so we cut those checks from when they come in. Uh, so the money comes to us 100% uh, 
but the deductions, uh, so it's the opposite side of that. If we have a poor place you know, leaving our district, uh, money's taken away, so that's why we see that deduction there. But the deductions are spread out over the course of the entire fiscal year. Um, then December number two comes, the very last column to play. And this is where we hop over to the new funding model, which is gonna be the portrait, the, the uh, sheet that we have in the second page. Now the boxes I have over to the right are kind of the reconciliation that leads into that sheet. So the yellow 373, 257, 65 traces from um, the landscape sheet to the portrait sheet. Uh, and it's taking into account the total from row F the total from row H and those two amounts, 216, 928, 44, and 903 add up to 217,831 and change. And then we hop over to the next column and I tried to separate these just to make them easier to identify. Then we take our 903 um, and our 42, 123, 46 um, and they, they divvy it out um, kind of opposite and we get our 43, 026, 46 and then the last one rolls in all of those kind of small one-off adjustments that we receive, um, as well as the total adjustments line, the 190,919.05, and we get 198,452.67. And all three of these numbers are on the January number one statement, if we were to look at that statement and print it off from ODE. Take all those together, we get 373,257.65, so that's our yellow, which traces to uh, the portrait sheet that we have in play, which is the new funding formula starting in January, February, March, April, May, and June. Um, we can see that the state support now changes. It's no longer the one line, the foundation formula, but now we have base cost, base cost, um, hyphen, student wellness and success, targeted assistance, special education, disadvantaged pupil impact aid, DPIA, English learners, gift aid, career technical education, supplemental targeted assistance, uh, and so forth, and they go. Um, now, this is the mistake. It's the, if we go to the top half, the annual amounts, see the negative 111,133.56? That's the mistake. So, I'm going to play the voicemail that we received from ODE. This is what we got a while back. It actually came to us January 18th. So uh, I have a sheet under both these. It's this one, and this is the actual mistake. I haven't printed out. So when she called and said there's a mistake from our fiscal 20 uh, funding for the uh, base amount, see how we're the only one in Cuyahoga County with a zero hmm. for our fiscal 20 foundation funding based on May number one? That's the error. And when we take that error all the way across, it's a negative 123, 30991. And that's basically the 111 that got adjusted um, but that's where the error happens. So when they were calculating our first payment under the new funding formula, somehow they put a zero, and we're the only zero in Cuyahoga County. I think we're the only zero in the state. Um, and I don't know how it happened. She doesn't know how it happened. So that threw everything off from the get-go. So our, it's a new funding formula that we're trying to figure out, and we know it's wrong. So trying to figure everything out is gonna be hard going forward with it, but I think, uh, you know, this. Reconciliation spreadsheet will kind of help us take a look at it. So this is the actual error that she was calling about that we have in place right here so everybody can see that error. So the way the error impacts us going forward 
So the month of January, we can see the annual amount and then our monthly payment amounts. And our monthly amounts, there's a lot of negatives. We really shouldn't have any negatives on there. Mm -hmm. um, but because of that base cost negative amount, uh, it bumped up our transitional support that we have, um, which is the guarantee. So by having that negative, uh, we still had to get our 500 some thousand dollars. So they had to bump up the guarantee, in essence, to give us our money. So that occurred January number one and January number two. And get the phone call from her January 18th. So they're going to fix it in February. That's where we see the big changes in the top half of the page in the month of January, February, or excuse me, February number one. So we can see our base cost goes from negative 111,000 to a positive 280,175, as well as the base cost student wellness and success. So that swing uh, right there was ODE fixing it. In turn, if we look at the uh, formula transition supplement, it goes down from 411,000 to 12,000 that we have there. Um, those payments basically stay the same, consistent for February 2, March 1, and March 2, um, for the most part. Uh, we have some additional SF money for Mr. O'Keefe on March number two. Um, the amount that we send to independence went down in March number one, and our college credit plus deduction went up a little bit in the February number one. I have those boxes around any significant change that's over $10,000 to give me a clue on that. Um, now the amounts that we pay back to ODE and, and where does it come from? So if we look at this email, um, that amount from Elena is 17,515.28. And I go, you know, my response, I go, hi Elena, just double checking. This repayment is for the adjustment we had from the new funding formula calculated incorrectly, 9,898.75 for February number two and 7,616.53 for March number one, which totals that 17,515.28 from what she uh, put up there. And I go JV78 insufficient funds mentions the district will have to pay back by electronic funds transfer or, or ODE will deduct from a future payment that amount. And I just asked her if it was possible that ODE could automatically deduct this from our monthly payments for the rest of the fiscal year. She goes, Matthew, you are correct about the JV78 adjustments. That is the amount total for March. I tried to get it collected through the foundation, but it looks like you probably will be insufficient the rest of the year. So we will have to collect this through the payment tile. So we'll have to pay OD. So where that amount comes from would be the kind of gray highlight and the dark blue highlight for February and March. It's on the insufficient funds row on the bottom half of our monthly amount uh, reconciliation. And we can see that 9,898.75 and 7,616.53. And the reason that's in is because, see the very bottom in orange? We don't have any money coming to us. So there's no total, it's a zero. So ODE can't have a negative there because they can't take money from our bank account. This is for giving money to schools, it's state aid. So in order for their statements of settlement to match out, they have to uh, make sure every amount's either positive or zero because they can't take money away. So that would have been a negative 9,898.75, but ODE put that amount in to bring it to zero and we're gonna have to pay that back. And that's because they gave us so much of that formula transitional supplement. So we actually have more money than what we should right now from ODE and that's why we're paying back uh, the overage. Um, now going forward, we're probably gonna have a small amount here and there, I would think, unless anything else changes as I'm going through it. But I just wanted everybody to see where those amounts are coming from and the reason behind it for why we have to pay back. I know this is a lot of information in front of everybody uh, to digest. So, um, you know, we'll have this purchase order to pay back ODE on the next board meeting. And, you know, between now and then take, you know, Go through it look we can talk about this more um, but uh, the new funding formula has a lot more lines a lot more you know restricted funding um, in it than where it was before so are you are you comfortable then that these adjustments that are being proposed are going to bring us to our district to the position we should be relative to your understanding of the state aid formula yeah um, myself and mr evans we we looked at prior year 
uh, fiscal 21's amount and our anticipated fiscal 22 amount based off March number two. We are, from you know, looking at it, we're getting more from uh, fiscal 22 than fiscal 21, which the law talks about, um, HB 110. Um, you know, I, I think we were, you know, looking deeper into it. There were some parts of that calculation that, you know, just uh, stood out to us. But we are receiving, you know, as of the March number two payment, um, more money than what we had in fiscal 20. Well, not too much, you know, um, but we are. Uh, and these payments here, you know, they reconcile, they match up. I see where they come from. Um, it makes sense to me. But just that error from January just threw everything off going forward and just had a ripple effect. These are kind of the ripples as you throw like a rock in a pond that we're just dealing with um, until we get out of this fiscal year and we start a new one and hopefully it should be clean. They weren't ready for the new for funding formula. They, they, they said they weren't ready for the new fun funding formula. They let everybody in the state know they weren't ready with the new funding formula. What I didn't understand and our last meeting got canceled and Roush wasn't there. I was going to ask her, why didn't you just, since you guaranteed that no one would get less this year than they got last year, why didn't you just not mirror last January's pay and February's payment until you figured it out? And But they didn't do that. So um, uh, I, they went, they thought they had it halfway figured out, and we ended at, and again, the zero, as Matt said, we might be the only school in the state that ended up with a zero in that column, but uh, I haven't heard from any other superintendents where they were in a position, right? I've heard actually other years where they've had, districts have had to pay back based on errors made to the foundation for it. But this is the first time it's, it's affected us, and, and largely in part because of the new funding formula. So, And I did hear from uh, one of the first ring uh, meetings that I attend for treasurers, they were talking about an error that occurred for transportation. And the whole state was funded about 70% for transportation, meaning if we were supposed to be getting $100,000, we were getting about 70000 and the reason that is, is because one of the 600 school districts in Ohio uh, woke up in the morning and saw $50 million in their <laughs> bank account from ODE. So ODE somehow uh, gave that one school, like everybody's transportation funding. Yeah, they got an extra zero. So they couldn't give everybody what they should have because they have an appropriation limit. So they had to only fund everybody else at that 70% until they adjusted their appropriations. But that's why that happened. Um, I do want to find out what that school was. Instead of going through 600 um, <laughs> different screens, I'm going to ask them this Friday. Uh, hopefully they'll tell me. But um, yeah, that, that's just one of the, um, you know, errors. And what it's coming to be are people, you know, are just calling, you know, they have, there's a vendor out there, Forecast 5, and they're the ones that are kind of saying, you know, this school should be getting this, and they're reaching out to ODE and saying, this looks off, off and you know, they're going to conversate back and forth, and ODE might fix that. So there are errors that are coming through from this you know, new funding model that are out there that you, know, you would think ODE has, you know, they're checking it five different times, but it's, they're still getting through. Um, so we know ours, and we've heard the voicemail, and we've seen how it impacts us um, as we go, and it makes it harder for us to kind of plan and, and look. But overall, as we were just crunching the very top end number, you know, we are getting more funding than we'll in the previous year. Is that correct? I still have to calculate the base cost. I have to jump into that figure and see how it's calculated and if it's correct. Um, so it'll be, you know, it's fun. And I, it's I, a I, six I, year, remember it's a six year phase in too. This is the first year of a six year phase in for the new funding formula. If it gets past the, the biennial budget. So we at least know it's going to be two years because of the budget process and, and I'll address that when we get to my comments. But uh, and, and, and Aaron Rausch, and I know Matt's been in meetings with him, and I've been in the state finance meetings with him. Aaron Rausch started saying two years ago that the funding formula is not broken. And he, he didn't want to see a change. He, didn't, he, didn't want to see, he wanted nothing to do with the, the fair funding formula. He wanted nothing to do with Cup Patterson. He thought the floors, the, 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 the guarantee and the cap were working. And every meeting he sat with us, and he's a, he, he, he's a very cool, calm, and collective guy, but he made it very clear that he, he disagreed with the people saying that the, the, the foundation was broken. So, and now they're broken a little bit, so.
Well, it's a good segue, Mr. Evans. Superintendent's business. Just, just a, a lot of things happening. Uh, um, the play last week, Aladdin, uh, the fifth grade play, outstanding, uh, great happening in the auditorium. Uh, and what was really neat about it, I, I give Matt a little hats off, that this was fifth grade end to end. The, the back of the house, the lighting, the sound was all run by fifth graders. So Matt's uh, developed himself some, some students that when they come across the parking lot next year, he's got some sound men and some lighting men to, to help him work on some things. Uh, but uh, really a, a great job by Mrs. Curry and Mr. Bertoloni. Uh, Aladdin this week, the art show this Friday. Um, if any of you are in district tomorrow or Friday, Mr. Uh, Schaefer down in his room, please wander down there. He's got uh, art. You can vote on some of the pieces. There's about 30 pieces of art down there that uh, um, any, any of the staff have been able to go down and vote. Some just out, some outstanding work by our students. Uh, talked to Mr. McPherson today. Um, some, uh, some things coming for me. Friday, Ryan Kelber and I will be down at, uh, for an OHSAA meeting on diversity and equity. Um, I'm actually happy to go because I no longer have to defend our old mascot, mm -hmm. so I can talk about our new our new mascot. So I don't have to hide in the back of the room when the, the mascot <laughs> discussion comes up again. Um, uh, but uh, Ryan and I'll be there this Friday uh, next week. Uh, I've got a, a career tech meeting in Columbus, and then this uh, Matt Young and I will be attending uh, uh, the Fair Funding Group is going to meet in June at Olentangy High School uh, in Columbus because. Quite honestly, the press right now is, as I just said, the fair funding formula was only built into this budget, so it's only built in for two years. As we said before, there's a six-year phase, and so the superintendents right now and the treasurers are involved are starting to work on what does that next phase look like to, to put some pressure on the legislature to make sure that it carries over, because they can, just as it was difficult to get into law, but they can very easily take it out of the law with the next budget bill. So with all the work that's gone into that, we want to ensure that it stays in place to see that it gets fully funded over the next, you know, the, the, for going, moving forward. So uh, the superintendents are working hard on that. Now that was the meeting that we attended down at Brexville. That was kind of the kickoff to that. Uh, the Olin Tangy meeting is going to be a, kind of a next step for that as well. Um, uh, the state superintendent search is down to seven. Uh, three from Ohio, Tom Hostler from Perrysburg, who was actually one of the architects of the fair funding plan from the superintendent's end of it. Uh, Carrollton superintendent, um, uh, Springsboro, Springboro superintendent, uh, the former vice president of the state school board, he resigned from the state school board to uh, put his name in the hat to be the state school superintendent. Formerly, he was the superintendent of Reynoldsburg schools, and then there's three from out of state. One's a sitting superintendent in New Jersey, uh, and two others that are, are ones with a federal office and one other one. So there's seven. They're meeting Monday and Tuesday uh, in executive session. Uh, to, to move forward with that. So that's the first news that we've had on movement on the, the next state superintendent search. So um, a lot going on. Um, uh, we get some elections done. I think we're just going to really have to be attuned to what's going to happen in lame duck. Uh, the one I didn't mention was 616. I, I mentioned the Lindy before I got it, which is just really kind of ludicrous. I uh, the, the state representative that proposed House Bill 616 they showed her last night on TV, and she was literally running from the cameras, refusing to answer any questions about, and it was, it, a, a portion of it was not using the term gay in schools anymore. That was a, a portion of it. So it was, I haven't even had a chance to look at it, but the, some of the things that I've seen posted about it just are, are don't don't make a whole lot of sense. But it's, again, it's part of that, that the group that says, trying to ban critical race theory, which, to my knowledge, nobody in the state of Ohio is teaching, but yet they still want to ban it. So that's like saying that, even though the speed limit on 71st Street is 25 miles an hour, we're not going to let you drive 100 miles an hour. Well, nobody's doing that anyhow, so why, why would you Why would you even have a discussion about it? So, um, but um, schools and school legislation is under attack, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. Nobody that I talk to uh, from the BASA or from the uh, Latin legislative end uh, sees it going away anytime soon, so we just have to make sure that we're we're, uh, we stay attuned to what's going on and, uh, and continue to do the good things for our kids here. So, Next Tuesday, the George Gross Invitational. We're going to have great weather because it's, it's in Mr. Gross's honor, so we know that the sun will be shining. Uh, the end of the month, the uh, 65th Cuyahoga Relays at the end of the month on Saturday, the, I think, what's it, the 29th or 30th, I think, the end of So if you can make it, make it there for that, that's always a great event. Uh, 
Um, Wait, that's graduations then. Like, is it the weekend before? Because graduate that's Memorial Day weekend. No, it's April. 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 Oh. It's not May. Oh. <laughs> spring spring break starts next Friday. Um, we have the latest spring break, but the, the, the which uh, we're going to limp into spring break. State testing going on this week. Uh, uh, hats out to Mr. Young and all the teachers and all of our tech department for for what they've done uh, to get us ready for state testing. Kids are the, tomorrow. We'll have seventy kids down here in the which is why we're up here down here in the library testing tomorrow morning. Uh, they, they they seem to be getting in. And, one of, the, one of the things that we got back yesterday is that our, we will have uh, a good portion of our state test results back before school's out, uh, which is a first time promise from the state. Uh, we've always asked, they're done electronically, what's the holdup on them? Um, and quite honestly, they've gotten them back to us sooner than what they said they would get them back. Uh, but the, I, I know math, maybe social studies, they were geared to have back in May at some point in time. Um, some of them will drift in the summer, so uh, that's that's encouraging on that end of it. Uh, so, and we're anxious to see what the numbers are because that, that's just going to help us kind of recalibrate what we need to be doing in our classrooms and as we come out of this and, and make whatever adjustments that we need to make. So, uh, coming up, I'll um, in my in the Friday updates, uh, I'll update you on some staffing. I don't know that uh, possibly one position where we're going to do a testing uh, position in the elementary building that will. Because of the high amount of testing, it'll, it's kind of a data collection that will, all the iReady will run through one person instead of the individual classrooms. So that will also free up some time, some scheduled time in the elementary building for us. Um, I, I just uh, had a teacher sit down with me, an elementary teacher that is going to retire. I can't announce it yet because they haven't had a chance to tell their colleagues yet, but uh, I know we've got a retirement coming in the elementary building, which uh, saddens me, but uh, an opportunity for some of the young people over there. So. That's it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, item number 10 would be board business. And this is a bit after the fact, but I'm going to make a motion to approve attendance at no cost for the following individuals to attend the OSB Open House to be held on Monday, April 4th, 2022 at Lorain County JBS. That was myself and Mr. Evans. So I made the motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? Um, I'm going to save my discussion for the board members' comments. So I'll just give you a vote. Mr. Dunnings. Aye. Mrs. Schubert? Aye. Ms. Brooks? Aye. Mr. Suchaki? Aye. Mrs. Eddy? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Uh, I don't think we need to get on consent agenda items. We need to speak to them. So we're under number 12. Board discussion from the board reports. Um, I, I guess I'm going to note that um, I attended the open house on uh, Monday evening and uh, invite Mr. Evans to chime in if he has any different thoughts or perspectives. But Mr. Bobo, Mark Bobo, is the, uh, I'd say he's the uh, a spokesperson for OSBA. He attended the meeting, and uh, he had, and I'll summarize his comments, but in a nutshell, he noted that of the probably 700 school districts that are members of OSBA, uh, that less than half participated in last year's delegate assembly in Columbus, and he let those in attendance at the meeting know that it's important that members, that school districts who are members of OSBA, that they participate in these delegate assemblies because the OSBA's mission and um, objectives and action plans stem from what's in the legislative platform. I looked at our January meeting minutes today and I noticed that we hadn't yet, we deferred action on assigning somebody to be a delegate for this year's um, assembly. So I would put that out as a future agenda item. We probably should get someone appointed or nominated probably by June so that when the platform comes out in draft that that person can have a chance to peruse it and, and share any important uh, pieces of the platform with uh, other board members. So I'd put that out there. Um, the other thing that Mr. Bobo said that I, I mentioned that I'll just reiterate is that he stressed that the legislative platform is the is the document upon which OSBA builds its um, its legislative and a good part of its lobbying initiatives. And so he stressed that that the OSBA speaks as a, as a membership and whatever the OSBA, the majority of the OSBA, uh, approves and puts into its platform is essentially the, the marching order, so to speak, that OSBA has to, to follow. So um, he highly encouraged all members to participate in future delegate assemblies. And I also want to thank um, 
our elementary staff today for the science day. It was very interesting. Fun. That's all I have. Yes, Mr. Um, yeah, I hate to say this, but did I mention HVAC in the previous meeting? In, at the, uh, at the career center? center, yeah. I did, I said that one. Yeah. I'm sorry. I get confused over what right. I talk about and haven't talked about. Uh, at our last meeting, uh, there's a, uh, we're reducing student fees as much as possible to prevent that from being a barrier to students taking classes. Um, you know, the money is there, so um, we'll use it for the students. <laughs> Found out that another place to save money, um, or a place to save money, I should say. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we had our IT presentation, and it was mentioned that they are giving serious consideration starting to use the NeoNet firewall perhaps next year or the year after. And uh, <clears throat> we found it interesting that we weren't and that we were paying quite a bit more to do it in-house. And uh, I think the IT uh, director got the message from the board members that we will move forward with the NeoNet firewall rather than trying to maintain our own. And then uh, a Twinsburg, Twinsburg uh, member uh, talked about something that was on the news that I didn't see. <coughs> news to me, but one of their buses had an emergency, mm -hmm. and you, you're nodding your head, and a fifth grader yeah. brought the bus to a stop. Yeah, I, saw that. I yeah. missed that one. <laughs> that was pretty cool. So um, yeah, yeah, brought, that, brought that up at the meeting. I guess I was the only one here who missed that. Yeah. Um, and that's all I have for CBCB this morning. Okay. Yes, you're good. I'm good. Okay. Ms. Evans? Um, don't really have much except good luck to all our students. Study well and do do well on the state tests. Um, good luck to all of our spring sports, and hopefully we'll have good weather too, so these sports games can get in and played. Um, and uh, look forward to the sound of music this uh, weekend, and also possibly the egg show. You know, a lot of nice things going on in our school, so that's good. Good, thank you, Mr. Cross. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Moving on then to future agenda items, I would just note, I don't know how we would do it, but I would suggest that we consider someone for the uh, uh, Delegate Assembly prior, I would think by June or July at the latest, that'd be my suggestion. I'll put the dates for um, next year's OSBA in the, uh, in, the, in the Friday update so you, so you can take a look at the calendar, because I know Sometimes people are reluctant to want to be the delegate, not knowing if they can accommodate their schedule that time of year. So that, that you're talking well, about this November, right? So just just to give some background too, I've done it. You've done it. We I think the three of us have done it. You really just attend a meeting. Well, you should study and read up. On it, but <laughs> you attend a meeting at OSBA, like the Capital Conference. I personally enjoyed it because you have a bunch of like school districts and just that, again that networking. Um, but I am aware that there was something that didn't pass because they need three fourths or two thirds of the of the um, population the of the membership, mm -hmm. and they just didn't have it. And there are districts we won't name any specific that didn't attend just because they had other things on the schedule, not us. And you know, it was legislation, or it was it was I, they were items that were significant mm -hmm. that didn't pass right. because of and, it. And, and, and had they had known. Someone who was there, yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the item that I think I mentioned before. Yeah, uh, that's. The item that didn't make that majority yeah. vote was one that I think the, the board of directors was very upset about because they yeah. wanted to see that pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 313 <laughs> were at the delegate assembly and there, I think Mark said there were. He said 711 is what he told me. That's members, but there was over, he thought there were over 600 in attendance. So, right. that, yeah. That, yeah. you know, that, that it's a little frustrating on their part. I, Mark's a go-getter. I just think that OSBA, uh, and I know he's a past president of OSBA, but I, I just think that his leadership is uh, is going to be strong leadership for OSBA in, 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 in his current role. So, um, so if I could just piggyback on some of your comments, Mr. Evans, about the pending legislative items, and yeah. you mentioned a lot, and some of them are fairly controversial. I think that that progression of those laws dovetails to a certain extent with OSBA's legislative platform. So to the extent that school boards want to have a voice in some of these controversial items, I think it would behoove us to have uh, be active participants in that legislative platform, either in just drafting it or certainly in being aware of what's in it, sharing it with our members, and then if we have 
by Paul Harvey discussed in detail. And you, you'll notice that sometimes when you get your updates from OSBA, you'll see Bass's logo on the top as well as the um, OSBA that, that Matt's a member of. So that's telling you that all three organizations are, this is the message from, and you'll see Kevin Miller, he's our legislative person, the uh, Mark's name, and then whoever for, for OASBA is, is, and you know, saying, so we're trying to send a unified message from everybody in educational leadership that this is how we feel to the legislators. Uh, and like this most recent one, that there was even a link to a letter, uh, and I know that they tell you not to send form letters, but I, what I oftentimes do is take a look at that form letter, and I'll pull talking points out of the form letter uh, to either make my own email or when I, like, I'll call Phil Robinson because I know I can leave a voicemail over there and I'll get a return call. The same with Crossman. And actually the same with Senator Dolan. I've, I've called the, them on a regular basis. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, again, with 126, I, I'll, I'll probably do both this week because we're coming back up, although um, they're not on that committee, but I will, I will contact Blessing um, based on what Tom Burton tells me that that's a, that's a call I need to make. So. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item 14, informational items, should be noted the Board of Education members received their agendas several days prior to the actual meeting, thus they have had a considerable opportunity to study and ask questions, etc. Upcoming regular meetings, regular meeting 7 p.m. on April 27, a work session at 6 p.m. on May 11th, a regular meeting at 7 p.m. on May 25, a work session at 6 p.m. on June 8th, and with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Cummins. Aye. Mr. Shrinker? Aye. Mr. Sprouts? Aye. Mr. Shaki? Aye. Mrs. Evans? Aye. Motion passes 5-0 at 7.26, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Just an hour off, Matt. <laughs> Can you blame Move me? Move by.